In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God saw it was good. As you can see in this diagram, the human eye is very complicated. Light enters the eye through the pupil, which is the dark hole in the center of the iris. The iris is muscle tissue, which determines the size of the pupil. In bright light, the iris closes the pupil, so not as much light gets in. Under dark conditions, the iris opens up the pupil, allowing greater amounts of available light to enter the eye. The iris is the blue, green, brown, or hazel part of the eye. The white part of the eyeball is a tough, protective skin. It covers the entire eyeball except for the clear area over the iris and pupil. This protective clear section is called the cornea. The cornea bends the light towards the lens. The cornea focuses the light entering the eye. Most people think that the lens is responsible for focusing, but that is wrong. The lens helps us to be able to focus on things that are close as well as things that are far away. The lens is adjusted when small muscles change the shape of the lens. However, it is the cornea that does the most to focus light that enters the eye. Light enters the cornea and then is bent towards the retina, where an inverted image strikes the rods and cones. The rods and cones send electrical impulses to the brain through nerve fibers that collect to form the optic nerve behind the eye. The place where the fibers come together has no rods or cones, so images can't be seen at this point. This spot is referred to as the blind spot. The optic nerve carries the information to the brain where it is turned right side up and analyzed. Humans have two eyes for a purpose. We have what is called binocular vision. The image from each eye is combined to give us the ability to determine distance. The field of vision is determined by how much you can see without moving your head. As we explore the eye, we see that the eyes are organs of sight situated in orbits, the sockets in the skull, the walls of which protect them from injury. The eyelashes, eyelids, muscles, and lacrimal glands also protect these vital and delicate organs. The eye is divided into two segments by the lens and ciliary body. The front segment contains the fluid aqueous humor and is in turn divided by the iris into anterior and posterior chambers which are connected through the pupil's aperture in the iris. The back segment, called the vitreous body, contains a jelly-like substance known as the vitreous humor and is lined by the light-sensitive retina. The iris is an adjustable diaphragm with an aperture, the pupil, in its center. It acts like a valve, controlling the amount of light entering the eye. The lens is a transparent, biconvex body, enclosed in a thin, elastic, transparent capsule. It is supported by ligaments attached to the ciliary body, which can change its shape. The ciliary muscle, composed of smooth muscle under involuntary control, alters the shape of the lens. The suspensory ligaments connect the ciliary muscle to the lens and hold the lens in place. The hyaloid canal is the remains of a channel that carried an artery during the development of the eye in the fetus. The cornea, aqueous humor, lens, and vitreous humor are all transparent, thus allowing the unobstructed passage of light from the exterior through the eyeball to the retina. The cornea is the most important structure for refracting light, although the lens provides the fine control needed to converge the incoming rays into the retina. The most striking external feature of the eye is the iris, the pigment-filled membrane that gives the eye its color varying from light blue to dark brown. The six external ocular muscles rotate the eyeball. The lateral rectus muscle moves the eyeball away from the midline of the body. The medial rectus moves the eyeball toward the midline of the body. The superior rectus moves the eyeball upward. The inferior rectus moves the eyeball downward. The superior oblique muscle moves the eye downward and outward, and the inferior oblique moves it upward and outward.
This cross-section of a brain, as viewed from above, shows how the image which reaches the retina is coded and relayed to the visual cortex. Light falling on the retina stimulates the fibers of the optic nerve. These fibers join to form a cross, called the optic chiasma, where fibers from the inner side of each eye pass to the visual cortex on the opposite side. Fibers from the outer field of each eye are uncrossed, passing to the visual cortex on the same side. From the optic chiasma, the information passes, via the optic tracts, to the lateral geniculate bodies, where perception of depth occurs, and then onto the optic radiation, which transmits the information to the primary visual cortex situated in the occipital lobes. The primary visual cortex is responsible for the perception of the position of objects in space and their relationship to each other, as well as the perception of light and shade. In this way, an overall composite picture of any object is formed. You know, when I was a materialist, naturalist, uh, atheist, really, I started examining the complexity of life. I started looking at this design that was inherent in all organic things. I started looking at these irreducibly complex machines at the microscopic level. Uh, X-ray crystallography and electron scanning microscopes were allowing us to look into the cellular world like never before. And, and I'm not a molecular biologist. I'm a lawyer. But I just used my, my thinking. I just, I just delved in and I started just examining these things with a critical, uh, critical mind. And, and I went to the subsystem level, as an example, in the human body. And I was looking at the reproductive system or the respiratory system, the, the human brain. And I was blown away that you, you have these incredibly complex systems that couldn't exist uh, you know, from slight successive variation over time. You either have a system in place or you don't. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, the human eye, for instance, uh, it's three totally separate subsystems that have no meaning by themselves. They only have meaning when they're connected together. So why would these three separate subsystems, the, the eyeball itself, the, the optic nerve that connects the eyeball to the brain, and the visual cortex of the brain, the lobe of the brain that actually tra translates the, the incoming pulses into contrast and color and depth, etc. So three separate subsystems that have no meaning by themselves. How do those gradually come into being if they have no purpose except connected to another fully developed subsystem. And the human eye boggles my mind. I mean, we have digital cameras today, and, and, and nobody would ever uh, assume that those just popped out of the desert somewhere. Obviously, they were created by engineers and put into production by automation specialists, and we use them, attach them to our computers by a USB port, and we uh, manipulate our images. You know, you know what's happening with your human eye right now? It blows away a digital camera. And yet, somehow we think that that just, uh, is just a gradual process from some kind of uh, uh, an optic nub on the end of an earthworm that somehow developed into uh, what we have in the human eyeball today. I just ask you to put on your critical thinking cap and think that through um, and see where you come out.